It's too early and I've had too little coffee. Um, Good morning. Welcome. Yeah, let's open in prayer because that's my brain seems to be all over the place right at this moment. Um, Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to come before you to thank you and to praise you for you. We praise you for the gift of salvation we have through your Son, Jesus Christ. That by trusting in him alone, we can have that eternal life. We can have security in him. And we just pray over this time together. We just ask, Lord, that you would be in it and that you would work through it um, and that you would be blessed and that you would um, help us to learn what we would have to. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so the last time I was up here, um, I started a little series that I want to kind of continue on. So if you were hoping for a Thanksgiving-type message, I'm sorry, it's not going to happen. Should have been here for the first service. We talked about being thankful there. Um, <laughs> so uh, we, I introduced the 12 apostles, who they were, right? And we kind of went through their uh, origin story, their calling, and how Jesus really called them out, right? Which was different for the rabbis of the day, right? The rabbis of the day, they would you know, stand at the street corner, they would preach, they would teach, and then they would wait for people to come up and say, can I please follow you, right? They were looking, the followers would come to them. And Jesus took a different approach. He actually went out and he called the apostles and he asked them to follow me, All right? So that's what we kind of looked at the last time I was up here, how he pulled them away um, and asked them to follow him. And today we're going to take a look at, now the apostles are following Jesus. We're very early into his ministry and we're going to take a look at and if my slide will work, it's not going to. Wow, that's cool. There we go. Um, there's supposed to be some animation there. Apparently it doesn't like me today. Um, but today we're going to look at the primary functions of the 12 apostles, what essentially their, um, their job would be, and that is hearing and seeing. This is what, um, what the apostles would have to do from now on. They are hearing and seeing the ministry of the Messiah. This is what they're taking in, they're learning, and it's, it's a, extremely important for them to fulfill this occupation. Um, one example of how important this was can be seen in 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1, verses 1-4, through 4, which reads, it, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it, and testify to it, and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Do you see the pattern in John's writing here? Do you, did you catch that, right? Um, which we have seen with our eyes, um, which we have looked upon and touched with our hands, the things that we have seen, right? That which we have seen and heard. John is really leaning into the fact that, hey, I am an eyewitness to these things. We, the apostles, are eyewitnesses to the life of the Messiah. And it's extremely important that they did this, that they fulfilled this role. Now the concept of hearing and seeing um, with, when it comes to the 12 apostles and why this was so important, we've got to kind of look at their background to really understand how important it would be for them. So the 12 apostles, um, they grew up and knew a world of the oral law, the oral traditions the fences upon fences that for thousands of years had been built around the original 613 laws. They would have learned about God through this religion, and some could say it was a new religion for the Jews, right? Because they had the Torah and then they had the oral law, right? So it was kind of a new, newer thing. And and so the Pharisees, what they would do is they would lessen the importance of the Torah, the, the law, and heighten the importance of the oral law, their traditions. They also lived in a culture that was looking for and seeking out a Messiah, right? They lived under the tyranny of Rome. They lived under the yoke and the bondage of the oral laws. They wanted somebody to step in and bring about this messianic kingdom and to free them from it. 
And then here comes Jesus, the new guy on the block, if you will. He steps into history, and he comes speaking in the power and authority of what can only be assumed as coming from the Lord himself. Right? For the 12, this is like, I want to liken this and, and bear with me, but this is like taking a baby to the beach for the very first time. Right? The first time you take a child to the beach, they're curious. They hear the sounds of the wave crashing. They hear the seagulls. You set their feet on the sand and they're curious. They see this water. It comes to them. It goes away. Right? What is this? What did you get in the minds of the apostles, right? What is this teaching? It is new. It is different, right? They're curious about it. And, and listening to what Jesus is saying is different than what the Pharisees would say. And they might say, hey, this is, might be a little intimidating now. Oh, I've dipped my toes in the water. It's cold. Burr, right? It's now a little intimidating. It might be refreshing for some, but it might be intimidating for others. And, and what Jesus is, is about to do and what we're going to look at today is this knowledge bomb that he drops on the apostles about the oral law and the traditions. And then after spending some time, what we'll see as the 12 apostles grow and develop, they will go all in. They will go hog wild and they are going to love this, right? They are going to love the teachings of Jesus Christ. Just like you take a baby at the beach. They're timid at first. They're curious. They're timid. And then you set the baby in the water and you say, hey, this splashes and does stuff and makes noise. This is cool, right? This is where the apostles are and where Jesus is taking them um, in their walk. Essentially this, eye and ear witnessing of the Messiah's life was indispensable for the 12, right? Um, This is what will prepare them for the future. This is what will prepare them to be able to repeat the same words that John had said. That which we have seen, we proclaim to you. Right? This is so vital for two reasons. John follows that up in in 1 John 3, uh, chapter 1, verse 3, the latter half. The first reason why this is so important is so that you too may have fellowship with us. Not only with us, but our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son. Their eye and ear witnessing, the hearing and seeing of the 12 apostles, allows them to to proclaim it authoritatively and for us to follow it and believe it because it is history. These are historical fact. And and leaning into that historical fact um, allows someone like Luke, the physician, the historian, to come in and write his two accounts. See, the, the apostles, they weren't concerned with writing down the history. They were concerned with making it. They were living it. And Luke, God places Luke in the life of Paul to do that account, to write these accounts down for us to be able to have that historical accuracy, that, those historical books. Luke, he says this in chapter 1, verse 4, or verses 1 through 4, "...inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that which have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. It seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things that have been taught. All right? Just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. Right? There he's talking about the other eyewitnesses. He's talking to the eyewitnesses. He's pulling them. Right? You see verse 3, it seemed good for me also, having followed all things closely. Luke is being a historian. He is writing down this account for us. And he writes down two accounts for us, which is amazing. But this concept of hearing and seeing, it isn't a new thing. It wasn't just for the apostles to do. This is something that was done throughout the generations of Israel. It's not a new concept. Um, You have some examples here, like like for um, the wonders and the plagues of Egypt and the Exodus. You have the account of that generation heard and saw. That same generation heard and saw the law giving at Sinai. 
There's future generations that will hear and see the miracles by Elijah and Elijah. Eliza, um, those two guys. And even future generations will hear and see the works of David, Solomon, the prophecies of Jeremiah and Isaiah come to fruition. Right? Taking a look at one such example, Exodus chapter 40 or 14, um, verses 30 through 31. The previous verses, Moses is telling of how telling this, essentially retelling the story of how Israel was saved from Pharaoh's hand. And at the end of that account, we have this. Thus says the Lord, or thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and they believed in the Lord and his servant Moses. Right? Israel saw. What did they see? They saw the hand of God working. They saw the Egyptians dead on the, on the seashore. seashore. They saw the great power of the Lord that was used. Right? This is the end of the climax. Right? Israel is now free from the bondage of Egypt. And Israel heard and saw it. You have to imagine the sounds. Right? When Israel walks through, they hear the chariots chasing them down that valley in, in, the, in the Red Sea. And all of a sudden the waves just fall. Whoosh! Right? I don't know if you've ever been to a waterfall, but that has the sound of a waterfall. You know, you take Niagara Falls, the closest you know, big one that we have to us, right? You listen to that. That had to be like a drop in the bucket compared to this, right? Because not only did they have the sound of the water, you had the screaming of the, the Egyptians, you've got the horses and the chariots, right? It's massive sound. And they heard it and they saw it and they believed in the great power of the Lord because of what they saw. Now for the twelve, Jesus will um, tell them of their great privilege about what they're about to hear and see. Essentially, he's going to tell them that the prophets of the past have desired to hear and see what you are about to, what you are listening to, what you are going through. Right, The stuff that Moses heard and saw, that account of Egypt being destroyed, is nothing compared to what you are about to hear and see. And Jesus does this in Matthew chapter 13, verses 16 through 17. He says, Blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, and your ears for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets, prophets and righteous people long to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Right? Jesus is reminding the apostles of how great this privilege is for them. So they're going through, they're hearing and seeing. We're still like at, at the very beginning, if you will, of this series, the very beginning of the ministry of Jesus Christ with the apostles being brought in. So we want to look at what I wanted to look at today um, and spend the bulk of our time on is what the apostles heard and see. What did the 12 hear and see at the very beginning of of the ministry of Jesus Christ. And this can be broken up into two main topics. Um, the forerunner and the doctrine of the kingdom. And we're going to take a look at both of these. The, the doctrine of the kingdom, I want to make sure that this is clear. This is not the mystery kingdom that Bill talked on a couple weeks ago. That's a separate I item that happens later down the, the road when Jesus starts talking in parables. This is the doctrine of the messianic kingdom. This is the doctrine that would have been ushered in if the Jews had accepted Jesus Christ as, as the Messiah at that time. And today we're going to start that, the doctrine of the kingdom. Um, it's, it's a very long passage, so we're going to start it today and finish it the next time I'm up here. Um, so the first thing we're going to see, though, is the forerunner. We kind of introduced the forerunner a little bit. Um, the last time I was up here, John the Baptist, right? He is the forerunner. He is the one that comes speak, it, speaking in the power and word of Elijah. And the, the 12 heard and saw him first, right? He was the one at the baptismal pool telling people a certain message, right? And that message was um, to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That is what they heard and saw first, right? The 12 apostles, most of them 
were at the baptismal pool with Jesus. They heard and they saw John's message. And after Jesus is baptized, he starts to repeat that message very early on his ministry, right? In those days, uh, which one am I? That one. Um, running two things. It's confusing me. Matthew 4.17, from that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You see that? He's saying the same message. But Jesus would do more than just proclaim the advent of the kingdom. He's going to do more than just say, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He is going to describe the character of the citizens of the kingdom, what you need to have to be a part of this kingdom. And Jesus will discriminate between the genuine members of the kingdom and the false or phony members, the people that would come in as liars, those that think they are a part of the kingdom, but in the eyes of the Lord, they really are not. And he does this in in what I am calling um, the doctrine of the kingdom, but what is commonly known to most of us as the Sermon on the Mount. And in this sermon, this is where he ushers in the doctrine of the kingdom. This is where Jesus will bring in the very lessons of what the Mosaic Law is. Now, a couple things to note, right? We're still very early at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And what that really means, and actually throughout the entire life of Jesus Christ, the Mosaic Law is in effect. The new covenant promised in Jeremiah does not come in effect until after his death on the cross. Right? That new covenant doesn't mean a hill of beans right now. And, and secondly, the other thing we need to note um, is that right now we're very early in Jesus' ministry, so the Jews have not rejected him. They're still inquiring as to who this man is. What is his teaching? How is he teaching? Right? They haven't even, so the, the Jews, they had, they had two methods of investigating someone that had messianic claims. First, they would come and observe watch the person and see, all right, if their claims are valid, then they move on to second phase. If not, then they'd write them off and say, this guy's a heretic, don't listen to him. If they thought that the messianic claims were good and possibly valid, they'd move on to second phase. The second phase was the inquiry. The Pharisees would start asking questions. That's when you see the scribes and the Pharisees piping up when Jesus gives a lesson and asking questions. They've moved on to that second phase. So right now, They're in that first. They're just listening. They're trying to observe Jesus Christ and who he is. So they're curious. Um, And so that really brings me to asking the question, what was the purpose of the Sermon on the Mount? Right? It's given at this time, the Mosaic Law is in effect. The Jews are still inquiring as to who Jesus is. He's got the, the apostles kind of in tow. What was the purpose of this sermon? And the purpose of the sermon was to show the correct interpretation of the Mosaic Law. This is done by the Messiah himself. The Messiah is going to walk through the Mosaic Law and give you what the correct interpretation is. If you were to take the 613 original laws and properly interpret them, this is what you would come up with. Um, And this is in contrast to the Pharisaic interpretation. The Pharisaic interpretation is the fences, right? Is what the oral law, the oral traditions. And later on, when we get further down into this, probably the next next sermon, um, you'll see Jesus say, you have heard it was said. He says that six times in the Sermon on the Mount. You have heard it was said. And every time he does that, he ref- he's referencing to this oral law. Remember, the oral law was not written down until sometime, I think it was 130-something A.D. This is still all oral. So when you have heard it was said, it's oral. You're repeating it. Um, so the, the messianic, or this is the purpose of the sermon to give the Messiah's interpretation in contrast to the um, Pharisaic. Um, what Jesus is going to do is he's going to highlight both the internal and external conformity that the law has. The Pharisees would essentially be teaching that the law only required external conformity. You do these rituals, you are fine. right? You do these sacrifices, you are fine. 
you stay within your little fence and don't go any further and don't get any closer to the original laws, you are fine. It's all about what you do externally. Jesus is going to flip that on its head and go, no, it's not just about the external. It's about the heart. It's about what's internal as well. So we're going to start taking a look at this. If you want to open, flip your Bibles to this passage, Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to start off looking at verses 1 through 12. Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. And this is essentially what the apostles first heard and saw. And this section here is commonly referred to the Beatitudes. And he says, Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 1, Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The Beatitudes, essentially, uh, in the context of, of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount here, describe what the characteristics of true righteousness are in the eyes of the Lord. And this can be broken down into two main sections. It can be broken down into righteousness in relation to God, and then righteousness in relation to man. And these can be broken down even further, if you wanted to, and look at them as our attitude towards ourselves and our attitude towards sin, and then our attitude towards the Lord and our attitude towards the world. And that's kind of how topically Jesus handles um, these beatitudes. So the first thing we see, or the first thing the apostles hear, is the righteousness that is in relation to God. And he does this with the first verse. Um, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Um, some would try to refer this to material poverty. You need to be poor, like not have any money. Um, however, that's not the case. That's not what Jesus is, is, is referring to. What he's referring to here is that we need to have a right evaluation of ourselves. We need to look inwardly and have no confidence in our own righteousness, but to depend on the Lord. Oh, there we go. Bye. Click there. Um, we need to know that he is righteous and we are not. This is the opposite of pride. right? No confidence in ourselves. The opposite of pride. That is what he is referring to. Poor in spirit. right? We need to look at ourselves and have good self-evaluation and know that we cannot do anything to obtain righteousness on our own. The next thing they would hear goes into the, our attitude towards sin. And that starts off with um, verse 4, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. comforted. This means to have a sensitivity towards sin. And that sensitivity will lead to a confession of our sin towards God. We need to be able to see sin how God sees it, as detestable, and treat it the way God does, and repent. Right? The whole point of Jesus starting his ministry, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Those who would try to defend or to cover up sin have the wrong attitude. And that's essentially what the Pharisees would try to do. Their laws around laws would, would give them ways to kind of get around the 613 original. If you take, for example, um, the Sabbath, right? You know, no work on the Sabbath. What the, the, the Jews would do is they'd set up this law, well, no work on the Sabbath as long as I'm inside my home. 
And then they set up another law that if you take a lamp outside of your home and set it somewhere, now that place is your home. So you set a lamp that is a Sabbath day journey, and now that's your home. And it's like 20 miles away. And you have another slave take another lamp 20 miles away. So you could, you know, say your home is anywhere. Right? They, they're covering up their sin. They're having this wrong attitude. Right? Jesus is saying, no, you need to not have that attitude. Do not cover up your sin. Next, Jesus would say, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Not only should we mourn over our sin, but we should meekly submit to God. This is not showing weakness, right? Meek and weak, right? They sound the same, so they mean the same. No, it's not. It's responding to God's authority and submitting to it. This is like a horse. When you break in a wild horse, right? That horse bucks and fights you until it meekly submits to your authority under the bite, right? We are the same way. I know I was that way. I bucked and rebelled the Lord for years. And then one day, I meekly submitted. God convicted me of my sin, and I turned from that. Now, on a quick side note, some shall say that um, the latter half of that verse, for they shall inherit the earth, um, they'll wrongly interpret that. They'll say that, hey, um, this really means that you get to inherit the earth and you get all the health and wealth of the earth and blah, 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 right? The people that have the, the kingdom now, new apostolic reformation, replacement theology, those groups, they'll try and say that Jesus is talking to the church and the church is replacing Israel and you can have all the good things of the world. That's not what he's saying, right? In the context, he is giving the Messiah's interpretation of the Mosaic law. If this were applied to us today as the church, right? If the church were to inherit, as Jesus is saying, then we as the church would be under the Torah laws. We're not. We are free from them. We are under the new covenant, right? That is not the case. Jesus is talking to the apostles. We can take this and apply it to our lives and meekly submit to the authority of God, but we do not inherit the earth. We will come and reign with the Lord in the second coming, right? That is a promise that will happen, but it's not for us today. This is if the Jews were to um, accept um, the correct interpretation of the law. So then he goes on in verse 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Um, The words hunger and thirst, um, they paint a picture of an intense longing or desire for something that someone cannot live without. Um, This is very similar to what the psalmist would write in Psalm 42. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When I shall come, when shall I come and appear before the Lord? The deer pants for flowing streams because it needs that water. We should hunger and thirst for the righteousness of God because we should. It, it, we need it, right? This essentially is to live with an absolute standard. The absolute standard Jesus is referring to here is the standard that is set within the Mosaic Law. However, today, for us, this can be expressed in a couple of different ways. First, it can be an ex- expressed in our desire to hunger and thirst for the righteousness of God, for us to be right with God, to take the above beatitudes and apply them to our lives, to look at sin in the proper context that it is wrong, to go to God and say, God, I submit to your authority because you have given me forgiveness. This can also take the the form of desiring to do what is right and to live out God's commandments in our lives, right? Our works, and we'll see this as Jesus continues on, our works is evidence of our salvation, right? And lastly, this can take the form of wanting to see right done in the world. We want to see good done in the world. We want to see God's righteousness done in this world. The next thing that the apostles heard would have been in re- the righteousness in relation to man. With these beatitudes, Jesus is telling his disciples that they should reflect the very character of God themselves. Um, and then with, with regard to our attitude towards the Lord, blessed are the mercy, merciful, for they shall receive mercy. In God's eyes, we are deserving of punishment. 
but yet God in his mercy sent his son to die for us. And we who have been forgiven much should be able to show mercy to those around us. If you have put your faith and hope in the Messiah for forgiveness, this should be easy. It should be easy to look at the needs of others and have compassion and to be able to respond to those needs. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. This means to be honest and to operate out of a pure motivation that is pleasing to the Lord. Or to have truth in your innermost parts. To live out truth. To not hold to a lie. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall become the sons of God. This is referring to a state of unity among believers. And this has nothing to do with political peace. Just keep that straight. This is not like we're going to bring up peace in the world and bring in a, a peaceful kingdom. That's not going to happen. You'll never have political peace. This is within a body of believers. And then Jesus moves on and he brings about the attitude that we should have towards the world. And that is verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This one kind of goes on with the previous verse, and that is living consistently with a standard that is not connected to man's standards, but living in that standard regardless if it brings persecution. We need to be ready for that. Blessed are you, in verses 11 through 12, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you and false, you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. So they persecuted the prophets who were before you. At this time in Jewish history, and even today, um, not only in the Jews, but in other religions, when you accept Jesus as the Messiah, there's a very immediate knee-jerk reaction to kick you out, right? To get you out, you have accepted this Messiah, you're no longer a part of us, right? There are people that lose families over this. There are people that can never go back to their community. The, you think of the Muslim nations, they will kill you if you convert to Christianity, right? This is a very real and immediate result of coming to faith in the Messiah, not only for the 12, but for others today. Um, we need to know that rejection from the world is to be expected. And we see this very early in the ministry of Jesus. Right? This is like the very first big preaching of Jesus. And he's preparing the 12 apostles for rejection. If you read the life of the Messiah chronologically, guess what? He's preparing you for rejection immediately. Right out of the gate. Get ready. This is going to be bumpy. Right? This is not just like, oh, it's all you know, roses and sunshine and rainbows and unicorns. No. You will be rejected. You will be persecuted. Essentially, the fact is, the world system is not seeking out the righteousness of God. That is fact. Right? We know this for certain. The world system is seeking out a standard of righteousness, but that standard of righteousness is built on society, the values of society, what other man would think and believe. It's not built on the values of the Lord. When we pursue the holy righteousness of God, we should expect a knee-jerk reaction. We should expect to be rejected, to be cast out. Jesus Christ received a negative reaction from his people. He went to his own, and his own received him not. In fact, they killed him over his, his word. Right? And what the Beatitudes illustrate is how different the Messiah's kingdom is compared to the world's society. The world will tell us to seek out righteousness from ourselves. Do good, right? Live your best life now, right? Seek the acclaims of the world, right? However, that is impossible within the eyes of the Lord. There is no amount of good that we can do. I love this verse, Isaiah. I spoke about this this morning, how Isaiah really is an evangelist at heart. He really like sticks it to you, digs the knife in, twists it, twists it again, and then maybe pulls it out. You know, Isaiah 64, verse 6. He says, All we have become like one who is unclean. All our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment, all we fade like a leaf. All our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. 
He doesn't say some, right? He says all a number of times there. Every single righteous deed. Everything that we think is good is like a polluted garment in front of the Lord. There is nothing we can do. And what these beatitudes do is they help us to show us that we cannot do this on our own. We need help from the Lord. And continuing on with what the disciples heard and saw, we had the Beatitudes, and Jesus is going to continue on and to tell them how they can see this living throughout their lives and through the lives of others. Um, we're going to be Matthew chapter 5. We're going to look at verses 13 through 16. And again, it's not that our works can bring out righteousness, but our works are evidence of salvation. And Jesus is going to show the disciples, have them look at, they're going to hear so they can see how this actually works. Matthew chapter 5, um, verses thir- starting in verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall, it be, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world, a city Set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So living out the Beatitudes, the first thing that they would, the apostles would see in their lives and in the lives of others is that they would be salt. Right? The disciples would be salt to the earth. This means that they would live out the terms listed above. And failing to do so would mean that they would be of good for nothing and trampled on. Salt has multiple purposes. It's used as a seasoning to bring out flavor. The disciples would do this by living out the Beatitudes. It's used as a preservative to prevent corruption. You know, God has always promised that, there, that he would preserve the nation of Israel that there would always be a remnant of the Jews that would live. And with the disciples being the salt of the earth right now, they are going to help to, um, to grow that. Right? There is coming a judgment in AD 70, and that judgment will destroy the city. Rome is going to come and destroy. And what the, Jesus will prepare the disciples to do is to be the salt to help preserve them, to pull out believers and get them out of the city before it is destroyed. And salt is also used as a method for creating thirst. This is the disciples, their job and their, uh, their task is to do that within the people of Israel, to make others long for the righteousness of God. For us today, we are to follow in their footsteps. We are to show, oops, I went ahead. We are to show the righteousness of God by living out our lives in the context of these Beatitudes to help others to see the good works of God. Not that our good works, again, is evidence of salvation. It is evidence of salvation, sorry. Not a means of salvation. There's nothing good we can do. But we can show the world around us the goodness of God by living this out. Otherwise, we too can be mixed in with the sand and thrown out and good for nothing. The next thing that the disciples would see in their lives and in the lives of others is that they would be the light of the world. Right? For the disciples to be the light of the world, that is that they are to provide spiritual light. They are to shine, use their good works, and point it to the Lord. Initially, there is no light in us. Right? There is no righteousness. There is no good works in us. Right? We saw that in Isaiah. But we are to be like the moon. Right? The moon reflects the light of the sun at night to give you light. I've, I, I've been out at night a lot more than I care to now with a little puppy. Right? I'm always out at night, and I appreciate the full moons now when it's the, there's not a cloud in the sky, and I can see the dog. She's running around in the middle of my field, and I can see her because the, sun, the moon is reflecting the sun. That's how we need to be. We can't be the moon on a cloudy night where there's nothing, right? Sin builds up in our lives. Clouds come in and cover up the moon's light. We need to not be like that. We need to be the light of the world, right? 
purposes of light, to shine in the darkness, to show paths in the night. That's what I get at night. I'm loving it now with my little puppy. Um, And then for us, we need to reflect the light of the Lord in our lives. We need to be that light. Um, I like Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. It reads, Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God, uh, without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that one day, so that in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith. I am glad and rejoice with all of you. Our work should be done so that we can glorify God in them, right? We are in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. But that crooked, twisted generation, they are in the night. And we need to shine as lights, as we see here. So I wanted to ask, how do we lose our saltiness and hide our light? Right? This is something we need to evaluate and look at in our lives. Do we hide our light? Are we quiet when we should speak up? Do we go along with the clouds as sheep? Or do we stand for truth? Do we stand for what is right? Do we deny the truth when it's presented in front of us? Even if it contradicts what we may hold and believe. Do we stand and say, well, you've presented something. It checks out. It is true. It's contradicting my belief. So I guess I've got to change my beliefs, right? Do we stand for our truth or do we defend lies that we may hold on to? Do we let sin into our lives and cloud up our light so that we're no longer reflecting? And are we ignoring the needs of others? As as a church and as individuals, we need to be beacons of light and the salt of the earth. And I'm sorry, I'm going to go over because I want to. Um, Luke (laughs) chapter 6. Jesus is going to pronounce four woes in Luke. Um, And this is very important, which is why I'm going to go over. Um, Luke chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. He says, But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. All right? Jesus is going to show the disciples a worldly comparison to the righteous in these woes. And I think it's very important that Luke wrote these. Because Luke, he's very likely a Greek. We know he was a Gentile. He's very likely of a Greek descent. And the Greeks would be very concerned with this his audience would be very concerned with this luke was very well educated he would have been from an affluent people right and so these woes would have affected his audience and the first one woe to those who are full right this refers to um, having everything that the world has to offer taking in your material possessions and having security in those i am secure in my material things not in the lord Woe to those who seek merriment or fun, self-satisfaction. One day they will weep, right? The world will tell you to seek for your own happiness. Do what's right for you. Do what feels good, right? Jesus is condemning that. Um, Woe to you when all people speak well of you, right? All right, self-satisfaction, merriment, there we go. Um, Seeking a reputation. Sorry, I jumped ahead because my notes are out of order apparently. Um... This is what the fathers got wrong. They went to the prophet that spoke well. If you read the book of Jeremiah, um, Jeremiah is standing for truth and he's giving out this truth. And what the king does is he goes to this other prophet and the other prophet tells him a lie and soothes him, you know, you'll never be conquered by Babylon. And what happens? They're conquered by Babylon. Jeremiah speaks the truth and is rejected. The false prophet doesn't and he's lifted up. This is what they got wrong. The very nature of self-satisfaction, self-seeking, seeking seeking out this reputation of self is ungodly. And it's what a lot of people do. 
So what is the point of these woes? The point is essentially this. Our happiness, our wealth, and our satisfaction, our reputation, needs to be based on the Lord alone. Not on what the world would tell us to attain. That is the point. We need to look inwardly as what the Beatitudes are doing. What Jesus is trying to get the apostles to hear and see. Look inwardly and change yourself from the inside out. Do not look to what the world is going to tell you to attain, but look at what God says to attain. Look at what the Lord says to attain. So let's uh, close in prayer and uh, call it a day. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you and praise you for the word that you have given us. We thank you, God, that we can look at these Beatitudes, we can look at your Sermon on the Mount, and we can see what you have been trying to um, portray to the apostles, to get them to look inwardly. And Lord, we just pray that we too would look inwardly, that we would see our own lives and to be the salt and the light of this earth, to proclaim your glory until you come. And we just want to praise you um, and thank you for the gift of salvation through your son, Jesus Christ. And we pray this in his holy, precious name. Amen.